Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us for this episode of Stay Curious with Nick Thomas for 35 years, one of the chief educators out there at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. Hey, Nick, how ben, are you? Good to see you, Mark. Always good to see you. Nick has been doing Monday shows on Stay Curious for a couple months now. We're so grateful for that. Um, I'm not sure how many episodes we're up to, Marty. We're, we're, uh, I have it on my calendar up there. We've got Marty Winkle, my cameraman, co-producer. How you doing, Marty? Doing good, Mark. How are you? Good. You got a special guest in our studio today. I do. I got my number four grandson, Jack. Hey, Jack. Jack's been on Stay Curious before also. Jack, look around to the December uh, date up there today, and 19th. And what number do I have under there? written 700 and something what is it 713 713 713th okay. episode very good lucky 13 for who's become my good friend here nick thomas we're so uh into you out there what he does what does nick do well we'll tell you here in a minute uh but we're also grateful for the kennedy visitors complex out there uh, Theron and his staff yeah. supporting the American Space Museum financially uh, gave us a, a little uh, check for our situation here. We're going to say that they're sponsoring your program here. Let me push that up there, Marty. There you go. Picture I took out there. I love seeing that NASA ornament out there. That's, that's, a, that's really one of the more expensive decorations out we there. We have a it? big circular one in the uh, center of the complex also, and it's up on a tee stand, so we call it the NASA golf ball. That's right. See that golf ball right outside one of your, well, between one two of your workplaces, mm -hmm, the right. astronaut office and then astronaut encounter, where there's a beautiful universe theater that we see astronauts twice a day uh, give their stories, and then you can get autographs. Uh, and it is the Christmas holiday season, or happy holidays, however you celebrate them. I would love someone to gift me that. Uh, that's a cool looking I ornament. Can, Old school, isn't it? I Nick? cannot imagine what that would fetch on uh, eBay. Uh, that's that's a classic. <clears throat> well, we're going to talk some old school stuff here with Nick. 1968, he and I both uh, baby boomers. So we were in our teenage years. Uh, that year, 1968, was one of the, the uh, well, just an, an incredible crazy year. Uh, we had two assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. The Vietnam War was raging in 1968. And then here we sent three men to the moon in a solo spaceship, the Apollo 8 command module. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But we do want to let you know that Nick is out there uh, to put his DNA all over your camera out there. I wish you wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I guess I won't. Sound, that sounds that sounds a little sketchy. He has handled so many cameras out there. You've been doing this so long, you handled the film cameras, right? I Not had, saying how old you no, are, Nick, had, just a, a statement of fact. I'll tell you, the day that I remember very, very uh, sharply was the day that somebody handed me a Hasselblad camera. That scared the living heck out of me. And I couldn't wait to take the picture and give it back to the oh guy because gosh, I'm yeah. holding tens of thousands of dollars in my hand. And I've never, i knock wood, I've never dropped a camera. But and that was the day, that, one day that's I definitely amazing. didn't you want to. Yeah, that's the camera that went to the moon, as Tom Usiak knows if mm -hmm. he's watching today. Uh, but to, uh, such a good service. Uh, just to, uh, make a little comment there and get you off there. Um, about these astronaut encounters. Yeah. Uh, they're such an important part of who the Kennedy Visitors Complex is all about. Uh, the astronauts seem to enjoy them. Yeah. And uh, under Bruce um, Melnick, who's right. taken over for John uh, uh, McBride this year, or last year, I guess, uh, really it's been a wonderful program. Yeah, and the astronauts, as I've said before, the astronauts really, in, not only do they enjoy it, but they believe in it in that it's an opportunity for them to reach to the public and make that personal contact with people who have watched this program since they were young kids and uh, people who are, who are tightly uh, bound to this program. And also, again, the second prong is to be able to make that inspirational pitch to the young people uh, to... Um, um, 
to uh, inspire them to seek careers in science, technology, education, mathematics, and to bring to them in a very personal way not only the excitement and all the technology and so forth, but the plain flat out wonder of what we do whenever we send people into space. So it's a, it's a great program. They enjoy it. They believe in it. And uh, as a sidelight, we just happen to have a hell of a good time there. Yes, you do. I know you do. You're a great host. Uh, he uh, is the astronaut wrangler that uh, helps escort them around the place. You put the programs together. And no one does outreach better, I'm sure, One of the, I mean, than Don Thomas. This is astronaut Don yep. Thomas with our good friend Carlton Bailey. Well, hey, you know, Carlton. Carlton was always so subtle. He is a subtle guy. <laughs> just blends into the woodwork, Nick. You never know he's there. Uh, yes, that is a jacket that has some cats on it. He and Carlton, that was out there yesterday, Nick, on yeah. your day off. Uh -huh. uh, he got wires crossed. He, he thought we were going out there in the morning, we being a couple of us here at the American yeah. Space Museum. Connie McDaniel, our office manager, she loves going out there. We bought our boss, Karen Conklin, a season ticket. Oh, good. So she can All come right. out there. Very good. Uh, with us out there. Uh, Don, uh, an Ohio knot from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, go Buckeyes, go Browns. We had a good time talking to him. Uh, Carlton was out there. To, he said uh, that uh, he took him a special picture, this being uh, oh, Don's yeah. launch. Uh, I think this is a woodpecker uh, crew. <laughs> Uh, and that up above the mass in the upper left is Comet Hale Bob. Yeah. Oh yeah, above yeah. the uh, 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 was that Columbia? Is yeah, it would USA be Columbia. Eighty-three ninety-four was Columbia. Yep. Yeah, yep. And I've learned Columbia has USA on the right wing. Yeah, uh -huh. that was the first one off the line, and that's how the way they were uh, yeah. decorating them then. So thank you, Carlton, for your contributions to our American Space Museum on our Facebook page, and uh, Don Thomas, thank you for a great talk out there. Uh, he went home last night. Where is home for him? Do you know? No. Is he living? I didn't ask if he's still I would have to. I would have to go Probably back Houston check. area there. But uh, we're here to for Nick Thomas to share his memories as a kid growing up in Daytona Beach. Uh, crazy about space. I grew up at Finley, Ohio, just as crazy about space. Uh, and the man that, that sent us on this path to the moon is right there. Yeah, that is a remarkable uh, 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 representat representation of President oh. Kennedy at Rice University when he made that thrilling speech about going to the moon. And uh, as I've said before, you listen to that speech, you get toward the end and you'll hear him go off script. You'll see him, his, his eyes come up off the podium and he's just speaking from the heart. And you can really see the fire in his heart as far as getting this country to the moon and doing it before the Soviet Union. So it was an exciting time. It was a very inspirational time, a very motivating time, and a very powerful time for young people growing up. Absolutely. We were going to the moon. And yeah. what, well, as we turn back the clock, Nick does a half a century, we have to emphasize the communication was not even one-tenth of what we have today. Oh, no. You listen to AM radio at the top and bottom of the hour was your Twitter. That was your most up-to-date info. And if you were like me, I couldn't wait to go to the library and get the, the new uh, uh, Aviation Week mm -hmm. and all these magazines yeah. I couldn't afford that would have more detail in yeah. there. Am I right? Oh, we always look forward to the, the Life magazine. And then, of course, uh, uh, National Geographic. Uh, Life, of course, had the uh, contract with the astronauts for their personal storage. So that's where you got to know the, the astronauts and their families. Um, National Geographic, of course, uh, brought out some of the most beautiful uh, images from that entire period, that entire space program. Uh, just absolutely glorious. And, of course, National Geographic did a feature uh, copy on uh, Apollo 8 in 1968. Absolutely. And of course, this is out of our Space View Park. Sandy Storm was the yeah. sculptress that uh, did this beautiful Excellent rendition. Job. And uh, one of, uh, well, I think Carolyn Kennedy saw a photo of it and said that's the best statue she's yeah. seen. She tried to buy it, I think, and it wasn't for sale. But uh, I'm going to let Nick wind him up and take us to the moon on Apollo 8. Uh, this was a big decision. We were in a heated race to the moon with uh, the Rus the Soviet Union. And like I said, 1968 was one of the most horrible years in, in politics and war for America. And yet 
we were still going to the moon with this crew. Yeah, absolutely. And as you mentioned, the, the times were so very turbulent um, uh, with the war, with the uh, loss of uh, Kennedy and King, and then, of course, the terrible social unrest in the streets. You can remember, oh, gosh, the Democratic Convention in 1968 in Chicago where everything went oh, that's nuts. that's right. That, that uh, is, yeah. So our country was, at that time, seemed to be coming apart at the seams. And the one thing that this country could watch with pride and uh, uh, excitement were the flights of the Apollo program. And it really pulled the country together. And I remember the, the, the now famous story of the woman who sent the letter to the crew afterwards saying, you saved 1968, which they, which they did. They absolutely did. I, I, I'm getting goosebumps thinking of all these things as a kid. I mean, you know, I'm uh, 1968. I'm... 14 years old and and you're as a young man coming of age you're wondering is this what's going to happen the rest yeah. of my life they're just oh, going to yeah. kill yeah. our political leaders left yeah. and right it was yeah. i mean i'm not exaggerating am i nick there's it's, some fear it's it goes back to the it goes back to the tale of two cities it was the best of times it was the worst <laughs> of times and behind us is looking out the window when apollo 8 started orbiting the moon uh is our is our green screen backdrop today but yeah Here's the crew. Nick's going to tell us some of the personal stories about them and, and just just how all th are all three of these guys alive, right? All three guys are with us now. And, of course, on the left, you've got Mission Commander Frank Borman, who had flown previously on Gemini 7. Uh, to the very right, you've got Jim Lewis, not having been surpassed until Project Skylab. Right, well, in yeah. the background there, there's Bill Anders, uh, our uh, flight engineer slash lunar module pilot, although we didn't have a limb on the flight. And uh, Bill Anders, a man of remarkable accomplishment, uh, he he ended up running uh, General Dynamics during its, I don't know, its peak period. I mean, everything was coming from General Dynamics at the time, and uh, and Anders helmed that. So uh, it was funny. Uh, Al Warden was talking about Bill Anders in his book, and he said, you know, Bill sort of likes to present the image of the cigar chomping. A uh, Curtis LeMay, tough guy, Air Force officer, but in point of fact, he's just the nicest guy in the world. Hmm. Bill Anders is 89 years old. He was born mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. Uh, here are the guys in the 50th anniversary special that, uh, wait, I'm going the wrong way there, Marty. Thank you. Uh, yeah. The gorgeous picture of these gentlemen uh, uh, four years ago. Uh, Anders, born in Hong Kong, is now 89. Borman and born was born in Gary, Indiana, and Lovell in Cleveland, Ohio. They're both 94 years old and and best of friends. Well, this 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 picture here is what you call aging with grace. <laughs> Absolutely, the three fantastic gentlemen. And until very recently, uh, Bill Anders and Frank Borman were still flying their own P-51 Mustangs. So, I mean, you have you met these gentlemen in your encounters? I've only met Jim Lovell. Okay. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting either uh, Frank Borman or Bill Anders, but they are a remarkable team. Uh, and as we'll go into it shortly, just uh, uh, so uh, uh, we're so indebted to them for their courage and their perseverance in making this uh, this mission of Apollo courage come true. Courage is a word. Yes, and, uh, I don't even. We didn't even put a picture of the space capsule in there. That tiny mm -hmm. command module that. These men were going to the moon, a three-day voyage there, three days back. And, of course, the great story is that originally in the original manifest, eight was going to be a high-altitude test of the lunar module. But the uh, CSM and Saturn V were on schedule, but the LEM was not. The LEM was a very complex vehicle, not the kind of thing you just roll off an assembly line. So when they found themselves with a Saturn V but no lunar module, uh, I think it was George Lowe who first came up with the idea of let's put them in the CSM and send them around the moon. And that uh, that uh, uh, mission parameter was uh, filtered around very, very quietly and very secretly among uh, NASA management. And finally, uh, Deke Slayton called Frank Borman. Frank was in the simulator. Uh, he might have been at Downey. But... Mm -hmm. uh, called him and said, look, you got to fly back here to Houston. I got to talk to you. He said, you know, Deke, I'm busy. Can't you talk to me now? He said, no, he said, you got to fly back here. Borman, Borman comes to Deke's office. Deke closes the door and tells him. He said, okay. He said, we're going to send a mission around the moon. He says, now you've got what we used to call in show business, you've got the right of first refusal. You can take that lunar orbiting mission or you can stay with your limb and fly it later. And Frank said, hey, I'll take the moon mission. 
And then Borman went back and informed Lovell and Anders of what they were going to be doing. It was no real reach for crew oh, consensus really? on yeah. that one. Frank was going to make the decision, decision, and he did. And, of course, it was the right one. You know, what I've heard, you've heard Lovell's interviews, too. Mm -hmm. He still calls Borman commander. Yeah. And they're 90 years old, and he, he says, my commander. Yeah. I mean, that is such respect for the, the that uh, i mean they're just not these guys everywhere in the program it filters down like that well right? of course borman and level food together on gemini 7 which was no walk in the park 14 mm -hmm. days in orbit that little gemini spacecraft closer than you and i are yeah, exactly we and of course have made it, they have we trained have made it. <laughs> they've trained so long for both missions they come to know each other so well and as i've said before <clears throat> a great kind of a balance between the two you had uh Frank Borman as a hard charger, and you had Jim Lovell as the e easygoing uh, 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 test pilot. So you, they really did, as I say, complement one another in the perfect, uh, perfect pairing, as, as good as uh, Sharon Stafford, as good as Grissom and Young, just a natural pairing of two highly professional, highly competent test pilots. Yeah, and obviously being friends, you know, and on the same page that way, so it was it was a big benefit there. Um, we're going to look at the mighty Saturn V rocket on there. Oh, I just wanted to mention about these guys in later life. Borman was president of Eastern Airlines, yep. got in the business. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's Andrew. the reason I flew. Uh, that's the reason I flew Eastern Airlines. Did it really? Because Frank Borman was president. There you go. He owned some car dealerships around Cary, North Carolina, because mm -hmm. my cousin worked for him there at one Great. of them. Got me a an autograph of his one time. Lovell, of course, became the commander of Apollo thirteen, mm -hmm. and then very instrumental in that movie that everybody says is was pretty good depiction there's yeah. very few things they can pick out i think all the astronauts pretty much agree that the, the motion picture of apollo 13 is the gold standard as far as uh as far as these films about space exploration are concerned thanks to tom hanks passion for mm -hmm. space oh exploration yeah absolutely too. yep there's a good thing in there uh so uh let's go to the moon here with uh the saturn V rocket there mm -hmm. marty you can take off that uh our banner on the top, I think, up there. Marty, I did want to ask you if you'd make a comment about why the Grumman lunar module wasn't ready in 1968. What's it? Why was the group, why was the lunar module not ready in 1968? As as Nick alluded to, it was a very complex machine that, uh, you know, was was uh, research and development <laughs> right to to the end. The yeah, main reason was. Uh... Design parameters were changing fairly often. Uh, we had a weight concern when NASA kept asking us to get the weight down. And that's probably the, the biggest challenge right there, is getting the weight down. But again, okay. design changes. It's still the only spacecraft built to operate only in the environment of space. Uh, human beings getting on a Saturn V rocket, the most powerful rocket in the world, was no small feet. Now, we would had two unmanned test flights of the Saturn V prior to Apollo 8. Uh, the first one was a mission where the preparation for the actual launch was long and arduous, and they kept running into problems one thing after another, and it was what would have normally been a flow of weeks turned into a flow of months. But finally, on launch day, everything worked perfectly. But then on the second uh, flight, the run-up, the campaign to the launch went very smoothly. The launch itself did not. There were some problems with the uh, early engine cutoff and uh, I think some other problems with the vehicle. But just like with the uh, Artemis, uh, afterwards the engineer said, we understand these problems, we can fix them, and that's exactly what they did. Okay, Mar uh, Marty mm -hmm. said Apollo uh, 9 was in March 1969. So. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, Tom Usiak said, thank you. Tom. Howdy, Tom. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, uh, the, it's amazing how most of the Saturn V men missions went on time and, and very few anomalies. And like you said, they, they, they knew what it was. Bytes is yeah. a megabyte, just to refresh your memory. Bytes is yeah. a megabyte, just to refresh your memory. And uh, my gosh, yeah, it's it's just incredible memory. People probably don't even know what kilobytes are. No, they anymore. don't. That's why I said a thousand kilobytes is a megabyte because people aren't even talking megabytes now. Yeah. It's gigabytes. Yeah, it's gigabyte now. In there. Uh, 
Nick, you're great to bring uh, us a bunch of pictures for our slideshow here, and you always find some some appropriate ones. Here, what do we have here? This is uh, crew breakfast uh, on the morning of launch. Uh, Frank Borman, of course, on the left, Jim Lovell in the center, and Bill Anders to his right. Now, on the right, I'm trying to remember if that is Charlie Buckley, who at the time was uh, head of security, very uh, very famous. Uh, is that Charlie person. Buckley? I, I I've think always it might. I've seen not, his name a thousand times. I'm not times. sure. I'm not sure if it's him or not, uh -huh. but uh, I know that Charlie Buckley would have been at that breakfast. He's on the back of every pass that you can imagine out there. And he was the security chief out there and uh, did, a, did a great job. And I'd like to point out that this is... Uh, NASA, so they have the most up-to-the-date, high-tech things, right, Nick? Yeah. Check out that television, buddy. Well, back in those days, that yeah. was it. Yeah, that it was that was the that was the high end of technology. Piece of furniture they always sure. were usually. Yeah. You uh, did your family have the one that had the record player in it too? On the uh, let's see. No, we didn't have that. <laughs> oh, okay. No. The whole console and everything. But yeah, I just like pointing that out. Uh, you'd have to get up and turn the channel on the knob and. All kinds of good stuff like that. <laughs> I saw a picture recently of one of these old television sets that was taken back in the early 1960s, and there's a little five-year-old boy changing the channel, and the meme said, uh, the first known picture of a TV remote control in 1963. <laughs> Absolutely. That was me. And Dad, <laughs> yeah. get up and change that. Yeah, change channel. <laughs> there's cartoon stop on there uh really rare photograph here yeah. nick that you harvested for us yeah this is uh the crew in the uh uh, uh simulator you see the command module simulator behind them what john young used to call the great train yet wreck yeah because you had boxes on boxes and odd angles and such now in researching this picture i was not able to to determine if this was here at kennedy the flight crew training building or the simulator at jsc but uh, we did have a similar uh uh, set up here at Kennedy Space Center. Back in those days, the crews spent more time here at Kennedy than they do uh, uh, today or did during the shuttle program. The shuttle program, you came down once for TCDT, you went back to Johnson, and then you came back here about four days before launch. But TCDT back in those days, being the big terminal uh, countdown demonstration test. Everything, yeah. uh, dress rehearsal without yeah. firing the rocket. Right, right, right. yeah. Uh, Nick, when we see our Apollo heroes and Gemini heroes, for that matter, uh, they, they're they wearing the best fashions from J.C. Penney's or Sears, okay? <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, uh, you, they're not wearing like, like our shuttle astronauts walking yeah. around in the blues. Yeah, very interesting. You've got uh, uh, the, the band lawn shirts and the slacks and everybody dressing very casually. It wasn't until I think the end of the Apollo program and certainly in the Skylab program that, she, that you saw astronauts going from place to place out here in the flight suits. Uh, but back before then, it was just whatever you had in your uh, closet. You just threw it on, and it, it worked. But, you know, some of them, I'm thinking Deke was always kind of distinguished. Deke had a red short-sleeve turtleneck that he used to wear. Yeah, and he on, had a gold uh, one, too. I had see a gold a one also, that, right. He wore yeah. like a turtleneck under his right. sports coat a lot. Mm -hmm. That was sort of his, his look in yeah. there. But uh, look at the guys there. They're just... Uh, I mean, uh, what you know? What, what a cohesive crew! It yeah, seemed. very relaxed, very easygoing, and you knew it was time to bear down and work. And you also knew it was time to relax and uh, and uh, and and take it easy. Marty, you have a question from our Stay Curious viewers. No, not a question. But Carlton Bailey said lost feed and looks like it cut off. So ask if anybody else has lost feed. Okay, if we're not getting through out there, make a note to Marty there that, that you've lost uh, contact with us. Of course, they won't see it if we have completely. We're going uh, into blackout, huh, Marty? We're going to the blackout there. Maybe. Uh, LOS. Uh, so, all right, Carlton. Uh, it could be his location, too, uh, as the squirrels and cats have descended on his property there. But hope we're getting through today, kicking off Christmas week here with Nick Thomas lead communicator out there at Kennedy Visitors Complex. And uh, he has attracted some VIPs for us to watch the program. Yeah, we have uh, a number of the astronauts that I've privileged to work with, and I've brought them into the Stay Curious world. And what I've done is I've sent uh, the uh, YouTube link to them after the show is over so they get a chance to uh, see the show and have a little fun with it. Okay, but we appreciate that. That's what we're all about, the American Space Museum. Yeah, I was going to, we're wonderful getting out, and I didn't put it on my computer there, Marty. 
Uh, so we assume that we are, but uh, uh, yeah, thank you all for, for watching. Stay curious, supporting us. 713 episodes we've done born out of the pandemic. Uh, so our humble nonprofit could be relevant when we closed. And uh, it has evolved to having A-listers like yourself, Nick Thomas. It means a lot that you're here and want to share your stories with us. Uh, as we got the guys uh, in training and around the breakfast table, uh What's this picture? This is actually from the post-flight uh, debrief, and I do not know what's being discussed here, but you can see that's a very lighthearted mood, and uh, even Frank Borman's having a good time. I would expect that before flight, Frank was probably uh, bear down serious. Uh, but sure. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you another thing. You look in Mission Control today, Johnson Space Center, and you see everybody on console, and by golly, they're in a tie or in a nice uh, a nice. Uh, uh, outfit. Everybody dresses in mission control. Yeah, good point. I, and 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 I like seeing that. There's a a, a protocol and a a uh, uh, a time for casual, a time for business attire. So yeah, and, you, so on. and as as opposed to say JPL, where they're very casual, mm -hmm. open neck shirts and so forth. Yeah. By golly, the men and women in mission control in Houston are uh, are dressed for the occasion. Right. You watch a JPL landing in my men craft and you'll see all kinds of outfits yeah. and, and so forth in there. Um, I don't know if you know much about him personally as a leader. I've read, we've all read our books and so forth about this. Uh, Frank Borman was the right commander for this mission, oh, right? Absolutely. And as I've said before, Deke Slayton had a talent for picking the right people. And we've always, always been uh, blessed uh, throughout the program having the right person at the right time in the right place and then and that's really been the story of exploration as a whole uh you have people like uh lindberg uh, uh al shepherd john glenn frank borman neil armstrong people like that who are just absolutely they seem to have been born for the for that one particular mission or in frank's uh -huh. case two missions uh and we again that is a uh that is a hat tip to the selection process, not only of the crews, but the selection process for the astronauts as a whole. And we had some very uh, highly skilled uh, 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 gentlemen in the office at that time, which we still do now. Uh, but this was, as I say, with Apollo 8, it's the first time, first man Saturn V flight, first three-man crew to the moon. And uh, by golly, you were definitely going to want the very best for a mission like that. And I think we did it. Absolutely. Yeah. We won the moon race with this, mm -hmm. Nick will talk about in a minute. So we didn't put boots on the moon. No. The Russians were so demoralized after this because their moon rocket had failed twice and they were way behind on stuff. And it might have been Lexi Leonoff, the first man on the moon, training yeah. with the Gagarin that got killed in a plane crash. I think one of the interesting things is in an interview, Frank Borman said, I wasn't in it for the exploration. I wasn't in it for the science. I was in it to beat the Russians to the moon. And Frank was the pure warrior uh, when it came to the... To the... their business, whether they could or not, well, to not, make sure they were... Not having heard that story, I've always known that Frank Borman was a stickler for everyone to focus on their job and not to be distracted. And as a matter of fact, again, in another interview, Borman said... At first, he didn't even want to take a camera up there with him because he thought that was a distraction. Oh, really? You know, thankfully he was proven wrong, and I yeah, think he's, oh, this great he saw that picture behind us here. He certainly saw that in hindsight when the uh, when the Earth came up over the Moon's uh, rim on that first Earthrise shot, which we'll talk about a little later. And this view of the Moon, unfamiliar to you astronomers out there like myself, that's a, that's a good shot of the backside yeah. of the Moon, the Hummocky Hills off to the left, where over Nick is where. The eastern uh, part of the moon is, or the right-hand side, as you're looking at it there. But uh, uh, yeah, Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, just oh my gosh, when uh, when they pass, it's going to be sad because they're they're truly heroes in my heart growing mm -hmm. up, and Always I know sad. yours too, Nick. Uh, well, let's go to the moon with these guys. Yeah, it was a uh, December 21st, uh, right. first day of spring, 1968. The moon was rising at that phase. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a superimposition. Some awesome photographer had the right angle there. Yeah, and here we are, as I say again, launching the first manned Saturn V moon rocket. And uh, just the power of that moment, quite aside from the power of the of the vehicle itself, the shockwave, the sound, the bright 
uh, the bright exhaust and so forth. Just the power of that moment to stand there and realize that you are watching men leaving for the moon. It was like standing on the dock and watching the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria uh, sail away. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a memory that I hold particularly uh, uh, particularly close in my heart. And that whole step through the mission from uh, launch to TLI to uh, lunar orbit insertion and so forth, I can just remember where I was at each phase of it. And as you've said before, but where were you? Were you grew up well, in Daytona home. Beach? Yeah, Did you up. and your dad come down? For yeah, the we launch? were here. We were here for the launch. We were in Titusville, really? twelve miles away, oh. and then we got back and. Later on that evening, uh, we're listening on TV, and they were preparing for translunar insertion. And I can remember distinctly after they performed that burn and they were on their way, I went into the kitchen where my mother was preparing dinner. I said, we're going to the moon. It was just a, a remarkable moment that you really couldn't, you couldn't really correlate in terms of, you know, personal experience. It was just so large. It just hit you so hard that you needed time afterwards to kind of sit back and realize what you just seen, what you just experienced. Marty, what's your impression of the launch of Apollo 8? It's, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, uh, it's just hard to describe, you know, something so big, so majestic and so slow moving right off that, that launch pad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Don Thomas in his talk was showing a picture that he said was four seconds after uh, SRBs and it had almost cleared the tower. Boy, this lumbered off the tower. Uh, uh, Saturn, Saturn V took 14 seconds to clear that Man. tower. And also during that time, the vehicle was performing a slight yaw maneuver away from the tower, uh, which you can only see in certain pictures from mm -hmm. certain angles. But that yaw maneuver was to keep from colliding with the tower because that was the, the worry that everybody had as far as the uh, first problem of launch was concerned. And in fact, those five engines of the first stage were programmed not to shut down during that time frame. They couldn't be shut down until after you cleared the tower. Interesting. Yeah. Never heard that little tidbit of those mighty F1s out there. Uh, well, let's go to the moon. I'm going to get a sip of... Look at that, folks. Thank you, my boss, Karen Conklin. Got me a little Christmas uh, present there. Stay curious mug. I know Dave Stangies wants one. He's jealous. And Dave, I'll send you a note about uh, what you asked me about after the show today. Uh, let's take us to space there. The, the trip uh, three days out there. <laughs> They did the, some TV telecasts. Now, these are uh, sl shots from the 16-millimeter camera they had on board. And here you see Frank Borman over in the left seat, uh, the commander side. Uh, just above his head, you can see the sun coming through the rendezvous window. And to the upper left of the image, you can see the uh, hatch window, the sun coming through there as well. And I'm looking over to the right, somebody in the lower equipment bay, but I can't, I can't make out who that, uh, who that was. Marty, we have a question. Yeah, William Whiting is asking, what was I during, where was Marty during the launch of Apollo 8? All, All right, William Whiting up in Michigan. Michigan. Great to hear from you. Yeah, I was just outside between the LCC and the VAB watching wow. the launch and then getting ready to go back and work on Apollo 9. Get the, getting the next one ready. I didn't look at what time of day that was. Do you remember morning? Usually, usually these were in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't remember. Uh -huh. It's kind of. 50 years ago. <laughs> Some hellison days around the Space Center there. i that just tell you. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned a 16 millimeter film because yep. I was on Flickr. I've told you all about all of the Apollo film is on Flickr, Apollo Archive, like a movie strip, mm -hmm. or like a film strip. And I looked through them all. I couldn't find any pictures of the crew on there. I said they didn't take any still pictures of themselves uh, among what I got a chance to look through, but all of them obviously were on. Uh, off of the, the, the video. Here's or another video, shot. Film. Here's another shot from the 16 millimeter canter, camera. Bill Anders on the right side of the spacecraft, the right window just over him, uh, sun coming through, and of course that beautiful uh, mission patch that uh, I think Jim Lovell largely designed uh, the circle, the uh, figure eight around the, the moon and the earth. Now, originally, it's interesting to know, but originally uh, Apollo 8 was going to be circumlunar, and it was just going to swing around the moon and come back home. 
But then everybody sat down and talked about it. They said, you know, as long as we're there, why don't we orbit? And it's a good thing they did because that's when they discovered the mass cons and the mass concentrations mm -hmm. that would affect the eccentricity of the orbit, uh, of the lunar orbit. So, uh, uh, yeah, very good decision on the part of uh, management. And I can remember reading the story of one of the, uh, one of the meetings where they're talking about this, about going to orbit the moon instead of just swinging around. And I think one of the managers was uh, somewhat reluctant to commit to lunar orbit. And Frank Borman was in the meeting and Frank said, you know, hey, guys, this whole thing is about going to the moon. You know, as long as we're there, let's go ahead and do it right. And uh, they did it right. They spent 20 hours, uh, two hours each orbit. So they did 10 orbits around the moon. We're going to talk about uh, the most famous orbit they did here in a minute. Marty, you have a comment? Yeah, it was at 7.51 ah. a.m. Which kind 7 of 51 a.m. Okay. Since I kind of worked the uh, 7 30 a.m. to 8 p or 7 30 p.m. to the 8 o'clock a.m. shift, I would have definitely seen a launch. Titusville traffic at that time in the morning was a real adventure, I can tell you that. And then gone home and got some shut eye, Marty, to go work on Apollo 9. Uh, that's 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 interesting there. There's uh. And then here's uh, Lovell. Jim Lovell down in the lower equipment bay. To his right, we can see the uh, uh, a nav station with the uh, sextant and telescope. And if you look below the telescope, you can see some write, some white writing there on the console. And those are the sight stars and their numbers that you would feed into the computer if you wanted the computer to guide the sextant telescope to the proper uh, sighting star. Hmm. They had manuals with them. They had flip charts that big rings on them to, to uh, get their uh, what they were doing, when they were doing. And there's a uh, uh, level at the uh, nav station. And on his right, he is, holds a small joystick, which manually moves the crosshairs of the section telescope to the proper uh uh, the proper star, and I'm not sure which eyepiece is for which. One is for the sextant, and the other is for the telescope. Mm -hmm. Interesting that uh, this navigation thing's not dissimilar to uh, same stars uh, that were used by Columbus, Magellan, Da Gama, all the great explorers of T Lindbergh. All the greatest explorers use those same stars, and we'll we'll keep using them. How do you think? Uh, Jim Lovell's uh, experience doing this on Apollo 8 helped that that very difficult maneuver on Apollo 13, yeah. firing the firing the, that the engine and having to keep the vehicle steady uh, manually. Oh yeah, this certainly gave him a lot of good practice as a run up to that particular maneuver. Uh, Jim, being the command module pilot on board Apollo 8, was responsible for guidance and navigation. And so he was well prepared. When that came up on Apollo 13, he was well prepared to perform that task. Just another little serendipity of their survival, uh, let alone Fred Hayes knowing every nut and bolt on that machine. What do you got there, Marty? Well, he was prepared, but Jack Swiker was the one who did the navigating on Apollo 13. Right. Yep. All right, good. Yes. Uh, uh, and on Christmas Eve, 1968, uh, they orbited the moon. They yes. did a live telecast, one of mm -hmm. six live telecasts they did on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget it, and I know you won't, Nick Thomas. Yeah, every Christmas I take the take the time to play the uh, reading of Genesis from Lunar Orbit on Apollo 8. It was such a unifying moment for all of us here on the Earth. Uh, just remarkable to look back in the, the context of human history as to how far we come in such a short time. And while some people who will remain nameless kicked up a fuss about the reading of the Bible up in space, hmm. uh, those people were going to be miserable no matter what we did. Exactly. But, uh, but it was an inspiring moment for, for myself as a, as a young boy. And I remember probably about six months later being one of the uh, altar boys who would read the epistle at Mass. I had the chance to read that uh, that uh, those opening verses of Genesis. And that really? was... Uh, that was a nice moment. Well, uh, you know, we are a Christian country. Uh, back in 1968, of course, we accept all religious faiths in our country. That's why we are, um, that's we are uh, the great country that we are. Uh, just got to note that we lost the feed again. Oh, my, I don't want to see that going on. 
maybe there's storms going up. What is that? Year. Just a Facebook feed? FaceTime. I think it YouTube. Okay. Okay. Switch to YouTube if you're not getting us on Facebook in some manner there. And uh, we will solve these technical problems and look at them. But we're enjoying a conversation with Nick Thomas, who uh, has been coming on our Stay Curious program on Mondays and sharing space history. And this is a seminal moment in the Apollo program where we bridge the 240,000 mile gap to the moon. Three days there, orbited for a full day. Then they got three days to come back. Um, uh, just, just an incredible time, as Nick and I've been talking about here. 1968, one of the just incredible years of of everything going on in our country, uh, and uh, and you know what they saw probably surprised everybody about what actually unified. Uh, Americans and the world was not the pictures of the moon that we watched as they read the Bible orbiting, but this picture. Yeah, the picture of the earth coming up over the moon's limb. Um, I would expect that this is probably one of the very first shots taken. And if you've gone to the uh, video on YouTube, which plays the uh, onboard intercom during that first view of the earth, uh, you'll see there was a lot of fast moving and changing of cameras and films and so forth. And this might have been one of the first shots taken on the fly of that earth rise. You see it's very close to the earth's limb there. And as it came higher and higher, the guys were able to uh, get a little more focus. But there in the foreground, you can see the uh, sill of the uh, rendezvous window. And uh, it, it the view actually is the vehicle was spacecraft was rotating. It passed from the rendezvous window to the hatch window. And I think over to the next rendezvous window. But uh, yeah, that would have been one of the first instances where they saw this incredible image. And you'll hear on the tape where uh, uh, they're, they're saying, oh, get a picture of that. And Frank Borman <laughs> says, don't take a picture of that. It's not scheduled. And I think at that point, Borman was kind of kidding his own reputation because Borman up to that time had been pretty much blind. Yes, so I think he and had wasn't scheduled, on that. I think he was, uh, he was throwing a little dig at himself. I thought that was, uh, yeah. that was, uh, that was pretty cool. And so they scrambled for uh, color backs right. of their Hasselblad cameras, the right 500 camera, right, millimeter lens right, and all that. Uh, lenses and the right film and so forth, but it all paid off. And uh, today, when we go to the moon, they'll have every moment that they orbit and know where the Earth is and all that stuff. But this was quite a surprise. It was shocking yeah, to it them was, to see it pop up like It was that. interesting in that, of course, during the mission, all we got was the uh, black and white TV camera, and the Earth was essentially a white blob on the uh, moon's horizon. It wasn't until they came back and they developed those films that we were able to see these images. And... Uh, it was interesting in that one of the astronauts said we went all the way to the moon to discover the Earth. Absolutely. I think that's pretty accurate because we saw just the uh, the size and the uh, 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 the isolation of that beautiful blue marble in the black void of space. One of the most famous pictures uh, rivals mm -hmm. the uh, visor shot of Buzz Aldrin on yeah. the moon with Neil in the visor there. All three astronauts have signed this yeah. lithograph. Uh, from uh, Johnson's, or actually it was come out of the Manned Spacecraft Center in mm -hmm. Huntsville. And uh, that that's worth a pretty penny in auction and so forth. You can run across so. one of those. Uh, you you're might be uh, you might be able to send, dollars You might be able to send the kids to college. That's right, that's yeah. right. But the blue marble, uh, which then the great uh, popularizer of uh, space uh, and astronomy, Carl Sagan, really uh, jumped on this uh, to let everybody realize this is us. Mm -hmm. This is what we yeah. look like, a blue marble. Everything that has happened in humanity's records since the beginning of time. One of the astronauts said right this there. was the first selfie. <laughs> that, is, that is that is there. And uh, appropriately so, uh, Nick and I talking about it, that when these astronauts came back from the moon, yeah. They became uh, Time Magazine's Men of the Year. It was like John Glenn all over again. These guys uh, got the ticker tape parades. They spoke to a joint session of the Congress in very eloquent terms as to what they had seen and what they had experienced. And Frank Borman's famous quote before the Congress saying that exploration is the essence of, of humanity. 
And that's what we're all about, seeing what's over the next hill, seeing what's out there, and going out there and finding out for ourselves. Uh, it's all good and very important to send robots and rovers, but the human being has to be there to make the real, uh, I think, gut-level assessment of it and put it into terms that other human beings can understand. While we're all impressed by those pictures and images coming from the rovers, it's going to be a whole different thing when a human being is up there. And as you saw on the Artemis mission, we got some beautiful views of the moon and the earth from that spacecraft. But the one thing that was lacking in those images, as sharp and as clear as they were, the one thing that was lacking was there was not a human finger on the shutter taking the picture like there was on Apollo 8. And I think those are the pictures that I look forward to see. The uh, Artemis uh, 1 pictures were a nice warm-up, but I'm looking forward to an, to a human being putting that camera in the window and, and pushing the shutter. Absolutely. Hopefully we're going to see that happen within yeah. uh, 18 months or so mm -hmm. there. Um, ah. Well, we're going to... Nick's going to tell us a little about uh, Borman. This is probably, in my view, this is the best picture ever taken of an astronaut. And I think that even includes the picture of Buzz on the moon. Because put it in the context of history at the time, here we are getting ready to put the first three men on top of a Saturn V moon rocket, most powerful rocket in the world. We're going to send them to orbit the moon. And you look at Borman's face there and you see determination, you see mission focus, you see courage. And you see an, a, a, a total lack of BS, we'll put it that way. But even at the time, I rather thought that Borman, Frank Bullitt and Frank Borman, the fact that it's uh, steely-eyed, ready to do the job and not going to compromise one inch. And I think that's perfectly reflective of both the character Frank Bullitt, Bullitt and the man Frank Borman. There you go. Bullitt was a, a detective, uh, a great movie from 1968. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the star of that film was? The Ford Mustang, the 68 Fastback. And uh, uh, the, the seminal car chase in that, in that film, you go back and look at it, you can see it time and time again, and it never loses its uh, excitement. I did a little research. Ten minutes was that car chase on there, about an hour into the movie. Uh, and uh, he got through the streets better than Popeye Doyle ever did. And... <laughs> Uh, but... Same driver, same stunt driver uh, was with Steve McQueen. That was Bill Hickman. Oh, was that right? Hickman was uh, the stunt driver for the uh, uh, Front Connection, and uh, he was uh, the driver of the Black Charger. And when they rehearsed that at right. racetrack in California, what they would do is they would play tag. They would circle each other, and McQueen would come up on Bill Hickman's right and come in closer, going over 110 miles an hour, and uh, uh, McQueen would reach out and tap the fender, and then uh, Hickman would have to come back, circle around, and do the same thing to McQueen. They continued doing this maneuver all the way around that racetrack, and that's how they built their timing, their trust, and their coordination for that remarkable uh, car hmm. chase. You know quite a bit of stuff about Hollywood, too, and after all, Nick, you spend a little time in New York City yeah. as a uh, an actor, correct? As a struggling actor. Struggling actor. <laughs> well, hey, you know, in there, but uh, yeah, I, I love this man. He, he's got a lot of good taste and so forth in there, and uh, we are just pleased that Nick wants to be part of our Stay Curious here. And there you go, doppelganger <laughs> of uh, Frank Borman. Could it possibly be uh, the great uh, uh, actor... Uh, Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen there. And, uh, yeah, I hope not, because that would fuel the uh, conspiracy theorists out there. Steve McQueen went to the moon instead of Frank Borman. Well, if Steve McQueen had gone to the moon, <laughs> he'd have gone there in a green 1968 Mustang fastback. That's right. That's right. So, uh, well, let's get the boys back home here. What a rare photograph that is. Beautiful shot here taken from a KC-135 of the reentry of uh, Apollo 8. And you can see that vehicle encountering that 5,000 degree temperature, much the same as Artemis 1 did when uh, she came back home. Um, if you look down below the, the vehicle, you can see those sparks floating beneath it. And that's actually the service module burning up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are two UFOs there above the street there <laughs> following them in the, oh. uh, those are actually lens flares yeah. off the uh, fact of the, artifact of the camera mm -hmm. lens there. Yeah. But a rare picture there for sure. And then they're back home. Back on the Yorktown. And uh, 
just an amazing moment. Uh, yeah, look at their faces. That there. You, 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 I can't imagine how those guys must have felt at that moment. Uh, the sense of pride, the sense of accomplishment, but at the same time, the sense of humility, having seen what they just saw. Just a remarkable moment in the history of the program. Those three yeah. guys coming home safe and sound. And goodness gracious, you can imagine they were telling stories for a long time after that. The first human eyes to see the yeah. backside of the moon. We'd mm -hmm. seen photographs of it, but no one had really seen it before. Yeah. And uh, we've got this billionaire that wants to take Elon Musk's starship with a bunch of artists and so forth. And that's a, I think that's a good thing to mm -hmm. get that if they want to, whatever they want to do with their own money. But uh, uh, yes, we're we're into a new age, half a century later, of how we're going to look at the moon and treat this interplanetary exploration to our closest and it's, neighbor. And it's remarkable, even though we are returning to the moon, it's still brand new. Yes. It's still new and it's still fresh, especially to the younger people growing up now and experiencing this sort of adventure for the very first time. Uh, I, I've always said that I think that every generation should have an Apollo in their lifetime. A nice Artemis launch that yeah. we saw there that you pulled that image off yeah. there uh, and the contrast between that and the Saturn V yeah. rocket. Just uh, uh, we can't wait to go back. But you know what? This Artemis one. Uh, from what I've read, Nick, nominal, nominal, nominal. Yeah, everything just looks like it's tracking right down the center of the plot board. There were a few funnies with the vehicle heading up. So you find the problem so you don't find them in the real game. And uh, though we did find relatively, uh, comparatively few uh, problems with this, you can, you can be assured that the engineers and the scientists are going to be all over them, working them, solving them, and uh, bringing about uh, an even... A better or more robust vehicle for our first uh, man flight of the of the spacecraft about two years from now good job to you the artemis yeah. generation out yeah. there yeah uh we got some usual people watching today carlton bailey tom usiak doug forrest great to see you doug i need to call you and wish you a merry christmas and your wife there in los angeles dave stangy who else we got there well, let's see, we got Lynn Langford and Lynn Lam Langford McDaniel, I'm sorry, okay. uh, Cliff Watson, William Whitey. Cliff Watson is in Pomona, Australia. And ah, thank you for okay. the stars that he sends us, Cliff. Great. Uh, Tammy uh, Miller, uh, Heather Smith, Robert Law, I believe that is, Dundee Margot Scotland. Watson. And, uh, hey, Margot Watson, she's got a friend that has got moon water. Have you heard about the moon water? No, I haven't. Well, we're going to bring you some moon water. We're going to drink some moon water on the set uh, with uh, this young lady who Margo's turned me on to. And name escapes me at the moment, but that's my senior moment. And let's see, uh, Mahmoud Abdul Aziz and Dane Damano. All right. Thank you I'd, all for I'd, staying I'd, curious. I'd very quickly like to say hello to some friends that I'm going to send this YouTube uh, link to. Uh, some of the astronauts that I'm privileged to work with, which include Susan Kilrain, Wendy Lawrence, uh, uh, let's see, Fencer. Um, you know, it's bad when you remember the call signs. You can't know, remember the real name. That's so bad. Terry Wilcott. I'm sorry. Terry Wilcott is Fencer. Oh, yeah. And, uh, is he Spencer? Fencer. Oh, Fencer. C-E-R. Yeah, he does and, a great uh, pro program. Uh, I, I met Terry and Wendy Lawrence. John McBride and uh, many others that I'll be saying this links to. Uh, so the members of the astronaut community are becoming members of the uh, Stay Curious community, and uh, I think that's great. We love it. Thank you very much. John McBride, shout out to you. He's yeah. been a great supporter of our uh, American Space Museum. John, if you want to sit where I'm at and have Nick interview you someday, any of you, yes, I will relinquish my vest to him so uh, we could get you folks on I that. saw John a few nights ago over at his house. We had a get-together for the launch of that uh, Falcon 9 rocket, All right. and uh, we had a very good time, so it was good seeing the skipper again. Yeah, great, great. We've seen your son in our building here, Stay John tuned. Jr., but uh, uh, need to see you back in here, Mr. McBride. He certainly did a fabulous job mm -hmm. as the head astronaut out there at the Kennedy Space Center uh, Visitors Complex for, yeah, he was out there over 10 years, wasn't he? And as I say, when John came on board, he was part of the machinery that got Atlantis out there. And John was uh, very quick to remind all the people in management that, uh, you know, you guys don't have one of these things by divine right. You're going to have to fight for it because the competition for these orbiters are going to be very, very uh, fast and furious, and any proposal that you submit has just got to be top of the game. They submitted that proposal. It was top of the game, and the rest is history. 
Well, over 300 American astronauts that have rode the shuttle, and, and uh, we are so grateful that you're watching us out there. And we know you do good things out there, just not these astronaut encounters, and that's what we love about them. Uh, uh, doing doing things uh, in their communities to inspire that next generation. Yeah. A couple little trivia things here we want to talk about before we leave the crew of Apollo 8. Uh, and a couple of things that I was surprised that you weren't really aware of. Uh, that uh, this Led Zeppelin album, A Whole Lot of Love, is the first time uh, when you set that needle down. That's what you're hearing. Well, not having been a follower of Led Zeppelin, I'm sure you'll understand that I well, was I on guess top I of this will. particular I, story. I, I, I will, but uh, can't imagine why not. But uh, 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 you were... More Sinatra and Tommy Dorsey for me. And I, I was a little more rock and roll for sure <laughs> in uh, my misspent youth. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Led Zeppelin two has Frank Borman on the cover of it. Yes, right. If you didn't know that, there's Frank right where he signed his name. He endorses this, mm -hmm. Apollo 8 commander. They thought it was Neil Armstrong, the art director in uh, uh, London doing this. Uh, yes, beside Frank is uh, the lead singer, uh, um, Robert Plant, and Jimmy Page is below him and, and the other two guys there. And this is his West Point picture oh, okay. uh, that they pulled out of there. And uh, I think it's cool that, that when Frank was presented with this, that he would, he heartily <laughs> endorsed it and, and held it up there to proudly autograph it. Uh, I believe this is probably at Space Fest a few years ago there when he was a little bit younger. And, uh, and then on this famous, famous moonshot, yeah. the International Astronomical Union that names uh, things uh, on the planets and in space uh, has named two craters seen in this photo uh, were named uh, after in honor of the Apollo crew. Anders Earthrise is that crater there and eight homeward is the name of the other crater. And there they are yeah. seen from a lunar orbiter photograph there. So uh, uh, that's pretty cool. A little bit of trivia to pick up today as we end our Stay Curious program here with Nick Thomas talking about I I got to say it's probably my favorite Apollo mission because how it affected me as a as a, a young man and uh, uh, in high school and that, oh, my God, we were really going to go to the moon. Now we were going to land on the moon after orbiting it, no doubt. And uh, and that's how I felt about it. Yeah. And to me, again, I, I remember the 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 absolute awe inspiring launch of that vehicle. And uh, the thought that you're standing there and you are watching, you weren't just watching history happen. You were watching human history happen. And it was a, a moment in time that everything came together for you as you as you looked at it. The 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 whole uh, exploration continuum, if you will, from the Wright brothers to Lindbergh to this moment now. Uh, and you realized it had not only continued, but it was going to continue. And now these young people, the next year and a half, two years, are going to be able to experience the same thing when Artemis II orbits the moon. Uh, it, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But it's my hope that the young people, when they see that, will take the time to absorb it and not just to watch it on a, a, a computer screen or a telephone or something like that, but really take the time to sit there and focus on what all this means for humanity, uh, the ability to go out there and do things like this, and also the fact that they too, if they work hard, they can be part of a program like this. So again, that's going to be another coming of age for another generation to see uh, humans orbiting the moon, and I'm very excited for that. I'm really looking forward to it. That gives us old timers something to live for. I think so. In yeah. a way, we really, 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 I, I want to see boots on the ground on the moon. Uh, I wanted to see Pluto was one thing that I was hoping that, you know, I would get to see in my lifetime. Yeah. And, and you know, we're not being fatalists here. I mean, we've got a lot of things that can take you out in a hurry, like cancer. So uh, it's just not being lo your longevity on here. And uh, I really appreciate Nick Thomas sharing things. You know, Nick, I haven't told you this yet, but you've influenced me in a way in the short time that we've gotten to know each other. Just like he said about absorbing it yeah. in there. Nick, I've set my camera down a few times yeah. and, uh, uh, at these SpaceX launches and, and you know, oh, I'm not going to shoot a streak. I'm going to adapt what Nick Thomas said there is I'm just going to take it in. 
Oh. And uh, as a working journalist most of my life, it's it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, your but you have good. influenced me that way that I'm trying to take in more moments in uh, the old uh, gray matter between the, the ears here. And it's remarkable uh, the memories you can build just doing it that way rather than taking pictures of it. Uh, infinitely better than when you're behind a camera lens. Um, it's very similar. It, it's like Bob Cabana told all the rookies on his cruise. He said, whenever you have a chance, take the time to look out the window and make that memory, make that visual memory. Look at that earth, look at the, uh, the, the, the cosmos beyond and make that memory and you won't regret it. And I think that's, that's true. It's certainly true for every member of, uh, Colonel Cabana's crew that I've been privileged to speak to. So yeah, take that moment to let the mind do what it does best, which is to record these images that are sometimes very hard to uh, uh, to pull all together in real time. But you'll find later on, as you reflect on it, all the shadings, all the facets will come through to you. Uh, and it is like a diamond with several facets. No matter how you turn it, you always see something new. And that doesn't happen with a camera. With a camera, you get the one shot, and that's what you get. With your memory, with your mind, you can record, although you don't realize, realize it at the time, you can record all of those magnificent facets of the experience that you're seeing. With all of our senses. Nick, thank yeah. you for sharing that, because a photograph, you know what I ask a lot of people that I interview, including uh, the astronauts sometimes, is what did it smell like? What did you hear? And this is part mm -hmm. of absorbing what you're watching. Yeah, this is, is our other senses there. So, sure. uh, Nick, thank you a lot for another thank terrific you. show here. And uh, appreciate all your preparation for it. And wish you a Merry Christmas, Merry my Christmas, friend, with you and your family. Country. That's right. And and uh, happy holidays to anybody out there that doesn't yeah. want to celebrate Christmas. That's fine with us. There's a old school uh, artist, uh, Mackie, I think is the, the name of that artist. There. Merry Christmas yeah. from Cape Canaveral. That's right. That's right. So anything that you wanted to share before we leave? I think we're good to go, uh, other than to say, uh, to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. And if you have the opportunity, go back uh, to YouTube and listen to that uh, uh, opening chapter of Genesis being read by the astronauts as they opened the moon. And again, listen not just with your ears, but with your heart. And again, see all those facets in that beautiful moment. And I'm going to post that on Facebook at your suggestion there so people can enjoy that this uh, Christmas Eve. So, Marty, do we have anything else to uh, take care of on our Streamlabs broadcast there? He is speaking to us on our USAC, the USAC family microphone no we're good to go we only had we had some facebook and youtube audio dropouts but there's nothing we can do about that no maybe it's solar flares maybe it's squirrels eating the the cables uh, we don't maybe know. maybe the ku band antenna was off the tail that's right that's right so well thank you marty for a great job here and uh uh, we enjoyed your uh grandson jack sitting in here jack good to see you again young man uh, and uh, thank you, Nick. On behalf of our American Space Museum, where for 20 years we've been preserving the birth of America's space age in its delivery room for Vard County, Florida. I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.